Hey guys, we are Sean and Christy. This is Long Long Honeymoon, where we are in a low low ho state of mind. Woo-hoo. Today we're talking about everyone's favorite topic, money. Yes, we're talking about budgeting a big RV trip. We thought it'd be helpful to focus specifically on the costs of an RV trip. Because an RV trip is like any other kind of trip. You can plan it on the super budget and stay at the really cheap stops and cheap restaurants, or you can go all out and have the super splurge trip. The numbers are really going to be specific to you and what your budget is. We're going to talk to you about all the things you need to consider when planning your budget. Yeah, when you ask how much it costs, it's kind of like asking, how much does it cost to visit New York City? Well, are you going to be sleeping on a friend's couch or are you going to be staying at the Waldorf Astoria? (laughs) Are you going to be eating peanut butter sandwiches or are you going to be eating at Gramercy Tavern? Riding the subway or you riding a limousine? Everybody's budget's a little different, but hopefully this video will help you in your planning process get a handle on what to expect in terms of costs so there won't be any surprises when you get out there. $140, $128 for the truck, $12 for the generator. Most RVs run on some sort of fuel. Could be gasoline, could be diesel. And RVs also use propano, also Also known known as as propane. propane. There are a lot of variables here. Uh, The year you might be traveling, we have traveled in the best of years and in the worst of years. I think the most we ever paid for fuel per gallon was in Yukon Territory of Canada. I think we were paying more than $8 a gallon for fuel. That was back in 2012, so. So I'm still bitter about that. (laughs) A lot of Canadians get very mad when I bring that up. Sorry, Jim. Jim Pratt. (laughs) He's wagging his finger at us right now. In Don't shoot the messenger. I remember in 2008, we were in California, and we were paying almost $6 a gallon for diesel in California. It varies from year to year. This past couple of years has been really pretty great from a fuel cost standpoint. A couple things that you can do. One, we've mentioned the Gas Buddy app. Gas Buddy will basically pull up all the fuel stations in an area and show you the price of fuel. So you don't have to drive all over town trying to find the lowest price of fuel. You can figure it out in advance. And sometimes you can find the 30 or 40 cent per gallon yeah. difference from one station one to the next. exit off the interstate to the next. So it might be worth driving, you know, one more exit down before you stop for fuel. The other resource that you can use, we talked about last week, is RV Trip Wizard and also the Good Sam a Travel Planner website. Both of those will take into account your miles per gallon and I believe the size of your fuel tank for your trip. So they will tell you about how many tanks of fuel you're going to have to need for the duration of your trip. So you can sort of have a ballpark idea of what kind of money you're going to be spending on fuel. Yeah, and speaking of fuel tanks, there are some cool modifications that you pickup truck owners can make to your tow vehicles. Some people put in larger fuel tanks, and that gives you a couple of benefits. First, obviously you can go longer between stops for fuel, Mm -hmm. and if you do find an especially good price on fuel, you can really stock up. Yeah. One other thing you can do is pay cash instead of credit. There are a lot of places, especially truck stops, you see that advertised a lot. They'll have, you know, the cash price versus the credit price. And it can be, you know, a 10 or 15 cent per gallon difference. So it can definitely make a difference. Warning, toll violators, $25 fine. Well, we're not going to violate the tolls. But I have a feeling the tolls will violate us. It's not technically fuel, but toll roads are are usually shortcuts. Yeah. And so it allows you to take a shorter route, but some states have some pretty expensive toll roads. Yeah. For example, I'm looking at you, Maryland. Yeah. I'm still bitter about towing our Airstream through Maryland and getting stopped about every 15 or 20 miles on these tow roads and being charged by the axle. Yeah. So if you're towing an RV... How long were we on those roads? Oh, I would say roughly 30 minutes. <laughs> so about 30 minutes of driving. We paid $32 for towing. And we didn't know any better. So something you can do to avoid toll roads, you're traveling with the GPS, Mm -hmm. check your avoidances. You can set your GPS to avoid 
tolls. Yeah. Now, if you're somebody that you don't want to avoid toll roads, you want to stay on those toll roads because maybe they're not as crowded or busy, you can look into the different states that use that Sun Pass. And I know it's called something different in other parts of the country, but in Florida, it's the Sun Pass. That way you have it on your windshield and you're charged as you drive through. And I think you get a a lower rate when you do that. We're not toll road people, so I don't know the details on that, but ask your friends that live in toll road happy places. Yeah, and I will say there are some <laughs> states and places that have very reasonably priced toll roads, and then there's Maryland. Yeah. <laughs> The Northeast is really where you're going to encounter the most toll roads with the steepest prices. Other places, it'll tend to be, you know, a dollar, two dollars, whatever. But yeah, some places it can be in that $30 and up range. So that can be pretty painful. And it used to be you had to have cash to pay it. What do you do when you run out of cash? We had that problem one day. <laughs> and it was like, cross your fingers that you don't get a ticket because um, you might. One other fuel to mention briefly is propane because yeah. most RVs are equipped with propane tanks. Propane we found to be quite reasonably priced in most places for as much as we use propane. We have yeah. two 30-pound tanks. If you have the opportunity to fill your propane tank at a propane distribution facility where they actually like have the big trucks that go out and refill propane at people's homes or businesses or whatever, you're usually going to get a much better price there than you are if you stop at Camping World, per se. Cam Camping World is pretty pricey on their propane. But most campgrounds, I think, where we get our tanks refilled are pretty inexpensive. I believe there are certain truck stops like Flying J that offer a small discount if you're a Good Sam member. Somebody told me one day, yeah. Shane, Shane, that propane. <laughs> you can get cheaper propane at Flying J if you have that card. <laughs> Some other unusual places that you can find propane include Costco. Not every Costco offers it, but especially when you get more kind of out in the northwestern part of the United States, you'll find more and more Costcos that offer propane. It's fine dining here. Next up, we want to discuss another type of fuel called food. <laughs> fuel for your body. Unfortunately, you're going to have to eat, you know? But Unfortunately. RVers really have a wonderful advantage if you want to control your food expenses because you got your own kitchen. You already paid for the kitchen. You might as well use it. That's right. Ooh. All right. Perfect. <laughs> and we do enjoy cooking in our RV. You do a lot of cooking in an RV? I, two minutes. I am actually a bit of a culinary wizard with the microwave. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> My wife is brave enough to tackle the propane oven. I I'm afraid of the propane oven. I know that anytime I go in to light the propane oven, there's at least a 8 to 10% chance I'm going to blow up the entire RV. No. Don't be afraid of your propane oven in your RV. Don't be afraid. And if your eyebrows are bushy and you want to trim them back, you can just get down there and use that click lighter, and you'll just get a refreshing blast of You're scaring of flame. people. Stop that. <laughs> No, she really does a lot of cooking. We also use the cooktop quite a lot. Yeah, we do use our cooktop a good bit. And we use our grill, our outdoor grill. In years past, we've traveled with our Weber Baby Q, a little propane grill that you can use on your picnic table or what have you. This last year, we traveled with our Traeger travel size smoker, and that was really great. Pretty great. We cooked a lot of great meals on that. That's obviously a, a great thing about RV travel. You know, if you're traveling on a tighter budget, you can control your food expenses. But I will point out, don't go to New Orleans and eat peanut butter and jelly sandwiches yeah. for five days. You know, we do look for local restaurants, and we, we always visit local restaurants when we're in places. We try not to visit too many chains restaurants because you know you can get the same chain restaurant food all over the country yeah. but what makes our country great are all these little mom and pop places for example we were recently passing through Las Cruces, New Mexico, and we've been there many times. Yep. We pulled out our Yelp app, and we often use Yelp to find restaurants when we're traveling around the country. Mm -hmm. And we found a place called Andales, and it was wonderful. We really had some fantastic Mexican food. It's probably the best Mexican food I've ever eaten in my life. 
So I'm not saying is something. That a stretch? We've eaten a lot of Mexican. We've eaten food. a lot of Mexican food, but it was it was awesome. It was awesome. So I mean, every time we're going through Las Cruces from now on, I can pretty we're much guarantee you we will be going to Andale. And it wasn't that much of a detour. I mean, it was a few blocks off the interstate. When you find yourself in these different interesting parts of the country, find the great locally owned restaurant and sample the local favorites. A lot of times, a lot of the best restaurants are not super expensive. Budget that in. Plan on experiencing the local food wherever you go. You don't have to eat out three meals a day, but planning, you know, a few special dinners while you're, you know, visiting a certain location, I think is smart and it will enhance your experience of the area. Next up, we're going to talk about campsites. Campsites can cost anywhere from nothing if you're on Bureau of Land Management land, you're boondocking or overnight parking at a Walmart or Cracker yeah. Barrel, or they could cost $150, I don't, $150, $200, $250 a night. A night. I've heard Fort Wilderness at Disney during the peak season now is like more than $200 a night, which is crazy to me. But So you if know. you're at Disney World or some of these really upscale RV resorts. resorts, then you could be paying just as much as you'd pay in a hotel room, which is yeah. kind of crazy to me. And when you're budgeting, you need to really look and see what the prices are per season because the prices can really vastly differ between the high season and the low season. I mean, to the point where the price can double in the high season. So when you're making your plans, be sure you check the website of whatever campground you're visiting to see what their price is for the time of year that you plan on visiting. One small money saving tip would be if you're going to stay in a location for, let's say, a week at a time, mm -hmm. some of these campgrounds will have weekly discounts, right. like week rates and even monthly rates for yeah. people who are staying long term. Times, if you're going to stay seven nights, you can pay for six and get the seventh night free. Right. Something else you need to ask about if you're traveling with more than two people, so if you're a family or a group or whatever, some campgrounds will charge extra for having more than two or four people at a campsite. So you'll have to pay an extra $4 a night per person for every person you go over two people. Or if you have pets, they might charge you a daily fee for having pets. So you might have to pay an extra $5 a night or $10 a night for having pets. So those are things that you need to look into because, you know, that can add up over time. Some sites are full hookup. Some are electric. Some are what they call pull through, where you can pull your RV in really easily and just pull through the site. Mm -hmm. Some are back in, which are a little trickier to get into. So they may have different prices attached to these different types of sites. Right. There will be some sites that will be premium sites that maybe have a water view or something, and right. some sites that are less than premium and they don't have as good a view or whatever. Yeah, so those premium sites sometimes can just mean the difference between being a paved site or a gravel site, or it can mean it has a fire pit or it doesn't have a fire pit, or you know it's got a picnic table versus a basic site that doesn't have a picnic table. So make sure you really need those amenities that you're paying for before you pony up for that premium site because you could save yourself a lot of money if you don't need a picnic table or you don't need a fire pit or you don't need a paved spot. So like sometimes if we want to keep our rig hitched, we will pay some extra to have a pull through site because we know we can just pull our rig into the site. Maybe we're just staying one night. We don't want to unhitch and rehitch the next morning. Or sometimes if we're staying somewhere for a week, we want the back end site because those are usually more private and we want to be away from the crowds. And sometimes like for instance, at a lot of KOA campgrounds, the premium sites mean you're closer to the amenities, which means you're closer to the pool and you're closer to the playground. Well, we don't want to be closer to the pool or playground because that means it's louder and more crowded. So we especially don't want to pay for a premium site there because that's exactly where we don't want to be within those campgrounds. So just make sure you know what it means when you're paying for a premium campground because you could be paying for something that you don't really even want. Now, even if you're committed to paying as little as possible for your overnight campsite fees. In other words, if you're doing a lot of boondocking <clears throat> and overnight parking, you're still going to have to empty your water tanks from time to time and refill with fresh water. Now, we've gotten pretty good about finding dump stations. There are some different resources that we use 
I guess Campendium is the one we most frequently use these days. Yep. And there are a lot of communities where you can find free dump stations. Their local municipal area will have a free dump station in certain counties. Some gas stations like out west, Maverick gas stations, a lot of times will have free dump stations if you're getting fuel there. Yeah, and they may not provide potable water, so you may not be able to refill your fresh water, but at least you could empty your gray and black tanks. Yeah, but sometimes they do offer potable water if you ask for it. So they may not have a big sign pointing you towards it, but if you go in and say, hey, do you guys have potable water that we can fill our tank with? They'll say, oh yeah, between tanks seven and nine over there, there's a water spigot that you can use. And we've been in other communities where they have paid dump stations. For example, last year we were in a town in Colorado and they had, I guess, a credit card like swipe, a swipe out. right on the dump station. And you could swipe your card and it was seven or 10 bucks, something like that and empty your tanks. And I believe they had fresh water there as well. So that's just something to consider from a budgeting standpoint that, you know, even if you're not paying for campsites, you're eventually maybe going to pay five or 10 bucks here and there to take care of your water tanks. Yeah. The other thing you need to think about is if you're staying in a national park campground or a state park campground, sometimes you forget that you might also have to pay to get into the national park or the state park. Just depends. National parks, you're definitely going to have to pay to enter the park to get to your campground. Some state parks, you'll get free entry if you're staying at the campground, and then sometimes you don't. You still have to pay to get in the initial visit. So it just depends. But that's something that you need to budget for because it can be expensive. Expensive. And we always buy an annual pass for the national parks because mm -hmm. we end up staying at enough of them where it just makes sense for us. It's $80 a year. It, and it goes by a 12-month period. So let's say you buy your pass in August. It's not going to expire at the end of the year in December. It's going to last until the following August. So overall, it's a good deal if you're going to be visiting a lot of national parks. Yeah, and if you're over the age of 62, you can buy a lifetime pass for $80, and it's good for the rest of your life. So definitely take advantage of that because when you have that or you're over the age of 62, you can also get half price campground sites in a lot of places. You can get half price tours and that sort of things within the national park. So it just depends on what national park you're at. Yeah, it's a total no brainer to get that lifetime pass as soon as you can. <laughs> Next category we'd like to discuss, we're going to call entertainment and activities. And, you know, this is especially applies when you're in really interesting destinations like the Grand Canyon or Grand Teton National Park or maybe in Yellowstone and you want to or take... Or Alaska. Or Alaska, <laughs> where you want to take a, a guided tour or boat ride, you know, you want to go kayaking, what have you. You know, sometimes you're going to have to rent a kayak or a bicycle or whatever you need. Yeah, and sometimes in certain places, the only way to see the place you're visiting is to take a tour. And I'm thinking about Kenai Fjords National Park in Alaska. The only way to see it is to get on a boat or to take a seaplane out somewhere. And then like Pictured Rocks National Seashore in Michigan, you had to get on a boat to do the tour to see the pictured rocks, you know? So that's just part of it if you want to explore some of these places. You know, in the Grand Canyon, you can do the, the mule rides down into the canyon. In Yellowstone, you can do the horseback riding. You can do that in Glacier. There are a lot of places you can do that. But it's just experiences like that that are going to give you a different perspective of the park that could be worth budgeting for because it's going to enhance your overall experience. So. And to point out the obvious a lot of our favorite activities are free in these national parks. For example, we love to go hiking yeah. and Grand Teton National Park, beautiful hiking. They're not charging you for hiking yet, thankfully, yeah. <laughs> here in the land of the fee. Other things to consider as well are museums. You know, a lot of really great museums are out there that you do have to pay an entrance fee for. Now, if you're in somewhere like Washington, D.C., and you're going in the Smithsonian, well, those are free. So you don't have to worry about it there. But other places, you know, like the World War II Museum in New Orleans, there's a fee to enter it. But it's worth it.
Finally, we're going to talk about something we like to call the Oh Crap Fund or miscellaneous. Your emergency <laughs> repairs, accidents, broken feet, broken fingers. Hopefully you don't experience any of these things. Blown engines. <laughs> Blown yeah. Well. <laughs> Blown engines for sure. Yeah. If you own a Ford six liter. Well. You know, we've had many, many R V trips go very smoothly without <laughs> any problems whatsoever. And then we have other trips that have been a disaster from the moment we left the driveway. <laughs> You never know what you're going to get. You know? No, you really don't. You really don't. First thing you can do, obviously, is double check every aspect of your rig and just make sure that you've got good tires on it and it's you know mechanically well sound and in good working condition when you embark on your journey. The second thing you can do is just kind of budget that occasionally something might go wrong. Yeah. It might not even be your fault. You know, maybe somebody runs into you. So unfortunately, these things happen probably the longer your adventure, <laughs> the greater the odds are that something's going to go wrong. I really think it, it helps to have a positive attitude as much as possible and expect something to go wrong from time to time yeah. so it doesn't just completely throw off your karma on your trip. If you have a strict budget, then you need to allow a certain percentage of that budget to be for just in case stuff, the oh crap stuff. Because I think what will absolutely ruin your trip is if you have maxed out your budget and you don't have any wiggle room and then something goes wrong and you've got to have something fixed and... You don't have the money to do it. And so you've got to put it on a credit card or, you know, whatever. And then it's just going to sour your trip. So put a little padding in when you're sitting down to work on your budget, you know, whether it's 5% or 10% or whatever. And just make sure you've got that set aside that, okay, we, we want to leave this little cushion here for the just-in-case stuff. Yeah, and really that's just good practice in life, period. Yeah. And we don't really want to create this fear of something's definitely going to go wrong when you go out on a trip because we have many smooth trips where nothing goes wrong. Right. But it's just a good practice to be prepared in case something does go wrong. Absolutely. And the final thing that I will say that you need to consider in your budget is your time. And I know it's a little different than everything else we're talking about because it doesn't involve money, but it kind of does involve money because money, time is money. Money is time, right? And if you're somebody that you have to be home on a certain date, like your vacation ends or somebody's getting married or you're, you know, you've got some hard deadline of when you've got to be home, give yourself some wiggle room because you never know what's going to happen. Somebody could get sick. You could blow a tire and you have a part that has to come in or, you know, give yourself a couple of days of wiggle room, especially if you're on a big, long cross-country trip where you're thousands and thousands of miles from home, just to make sure that you're not going to be pushing yourself too hard to make a deadline because RV travel is not like traveling in a car. It takes longer. You move at a slower pace. There's a lot more involved. Stops are more involved. So budgeting your time, I think, is really important because we meet a lot of people that they buy an RV and they think, I'm going to drive 12 hours in a day to get to my destination. It's not smart for you to do that. I'm not saying you can't do it. I'm saying it's not a wise choice. Especially if one person is doing all the driving. We know a few people who will drive those super long distances in a day, but... We're definitely not those people. I mean, it starts to become more like truck driving if you're right. <laughs> really punishing right. yourself with these super long days. Yeah. And you never know, I mean, when you're going to get stuck in a traffic jam or there's going to be a wreck on the interstate and you're going to get stuck sitting still for two hours or something. So just be wise with the way you budget your time. Listen to seasoned RVers when it comes to travel days and budget your time accordingly. Don't expect that you're going to drive 10 and 12 hours a day for three days straight to make it from New York to California, you know, for your two-week vacation. Time really is the ultimate luxury when you travel. I think you probably would be better off having a shorter distance trip where you spend more time doing the things you really enjoy right. than trying to drive to Fairbanks, Alaska and back within a 10-day period of time. And yeah. we've had people tell us, we're going to go to Alaska and back, and we figured it up, and we can do it in less than two weeks. They're like, you're going to drive 14,000 miles round trip in 
two weeks, two and a half weeks. I don't think so. I don't have think have you're going to enjoy anything. it. You're not going to enjoy <laughs> it. You're going to just be like, you know, hardcore. The whole point man. is to enjoy yourself. <laughs> enjoy the journey. Yeah. And you're going to enjoy the journey more if you're not under that relentless pressure every day yeah. to cover so much ground. Well, I mean, give yourself the time to see the world's largest ball of twine if you want to. Or, you know, the world's largest ear of corn or whatever. You know, it's part of the adventure. It's an interesting sort of philosophical question because, I mean, there's no denying we've spent a lot of time driving on interstates and you do get from point A to point B more quickly. However, sometimes there are more interesting experiences on the smaller highways and the side roads. And so, like, you know, last year driving through Texas, we went a slightly different route. Yeah. And we're on a, a small highway. Which... It was great until we hit that really terrible pothole. Yeah, it was. <laughs> it was. And then it was and like, Then it was terrifying. I'm done. <laughs> And it was like, let's go find an interstate. Yeah. <laughs> Woo, that was scary. Yeah, it was scary. That was probably the scariest moment of our trip. So I think Boy. that was not the exact point I was <laughs> wanting to make. But, you know, a lot of times it, the, it's the small highways, the small towns that really will reveal the character of a place and a part of the country yeah. where it's really going to feel different and you're having a true travel experience as opposed to being in another big, you know, shopping mall or shopping area, right. looking at the same name brand stores and fast food places that you could see anywhere else in the country. So that's it guys, a look at budgeting for RV travel. We hope this has been helpful just to give you some ideas of what to expect, especially those of you who've never taken a big cross country RV trip. There's a lot of things to consider. It's really about your personal travel preferences. Are you somebody that wants to stay in those Corps of Engineer uh, campgrounds that are $20 a night with water and electric only, but they've got amazing views of the water? Or do you want to be at the Malibu Beach RV Park, you know, where you're front row for the Pacific Ocean and you're paying 200 bucks a night? Yeah. Don't go there, please. <laughs> <laughs> they weren't very nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it's it's really your personal preferences and what you want to have. What, what sort of experience do you want to have? It's your vacation. Pick what appeals to you. And if something doesn't appeal to you, don't feel pressured to do it. As always, thank you guys for tuning in. This has been yet another episode of Long Long Honeymoon, the long longest running RV channel on the interwebs where we get into a low low ho state of mind. So we hope you get into a low low ho state of mind in the upcoming RV travel season. We're excited about it. The birds are singing. The leaves are springing out yeah and lolojo is getting ready to hit the road once again that's right comment down below and let us know where you're going on your next rv trip if you enjoyed this video click the like button please subscribe share this video with your friends and family and until next time what do we say lolojo Lo -lo -lo. guys what we're back that's right. I want to give you a quick update <laughs> on the ceramic coating at Vinny's North Bay Airstream Repair. Vinny is booked up so solid, he is not accepting new clients for Airstream Repair. Yeah. However, he does still have some slots for the ceramic. I mean, I think they're booking out several months in advance. Yeah. But if you're interested in getting your Airstream ceramic coated with the best stuff in the industry, talk to Vinny or talk to Brian. That's we'll have right. both of their numbers on the screen because uh, we had that done last year and we are loving it. Yeah, it's made washing our Airstream like a breeze. So easy. It looks so pretty. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> our Airstream really looks better now than it probably, probably did ever has. It. Yeah. <laughs> it ever has when we've owned it. So just wanted to give a shout out to those guys. All right. Thanks, guys. Catch you next time.